Good evening, and welcome to Restored Lore, your home for old, odd, and obscure stories. Tonight, we return to Cornwall once again for a supernatural story traditionally told at Christmas time called Duffy and the Devil. This story was documented by Robert Hunt in Popular Romances of the West of England, or The Drolls, Traditions, and Superstitions of Old Cornwall, published in 1865. Despite the name, the story is rather clever and playful, although you will recognize elements of the story. As always, Hunt gives lengthy footnotes, which I have mostly woven into the text itself. I think the transition between Hunt's voice as a folklorist and the narrative voice of the story is pretty clear. I will try to make it so. The weather today is pretty dramatic. I expect that you'll be able to hear rain and wind in the recording. Let's just call that ambiance. Now, let's open our imaginations and begin. Many of the superstitions of our ancestors are preserved in quaint, irregular rhymes, the recitation of which was the amusement of the people in the long nights of winter. These were sung, or rather said, in a monotone by the professional drolls, who doubtless added such things as they fancied would increase the interest of the story to the listeners. Especially were they fond of introducing known characters on the scene, and of mixing up events which had occurred within the memory of the old people with the more ancient legend. The following story, or rather parts of it, form the subject of one of the Cornish Christmas plays. When I was a boy, I well remember being much delighted with the coarse acting of a set of Christmas players who exhibited in the great hall of a farmhouse at which I was visiting, and who gave us the principal incidents of Duffy and the Devil Terry Top, one of the company doing the part of chorus and filling up by rude descriptions, often in rhyme, the parts which the players could not represent. It was in cider-making time. Squire Lavelle of Trove, or, more correctly, Trewoof, rode up to Bury and Churchtown to procure help. Boys and maidens were in request, some to gather the apples from the trees, others to carry them to the cider mill. Passing along the village as hastily as the dignity of a squire would allow him, his attention was drawn to a great noise, scolding in a shrill treble voice and crying, proceeding from Jane Chewin's door. The squire rode up to the cottage, and he saw the old woman beating her stepdaughter Duffy about the head with the skirt of her swing-tail gown in which she had been carrying out the ashes. She made such a dust that the squire was nearly choked and almost blinded with the wood ashes. "'What cheer, Janie?' cries the squire. "'What's the to-do with you and Duffy?' "'Oh, the lazy hussy!' shouts Janie, is all her time curtsying and caranting with the boys. She will never stay in to boil the porridge, knit the stockings, or spin the yarn. Don't believe her, your honor, exclaims Duffy. My knitting and spinning is the best in the parish. The war of tongues continued in this strain for some time, the old squire looking calmly on and resolving in his mind to take Duffy home with him to Trove, her appearance evidently pleasing him greatly. Squire Lavelle left the old and young woman to do the best they could and went round the village to complete his hiring. When he returned, peace had been declared between them, but when Lavelle expressed his desire to take Duffy home to his house to help the housekeeper do the spinning, "'A pretty spinner she is!' shouted old Janie at the top of her voice. "'Try me, your honour,' said Duffy, curtsying very low. "'My yarns are the best in the parish.' "'We'll soon try that,' said the squire." Janie will be glad to get quits of thee, I see, and there'll be nothing loth to leave her, so jump up behind me, Duffy. No sooner said than done. The maid Duffy, without ceremony, mounted behind the squire on the horse, and they jogged silently down to Trove. Squire Lavelle's old housekeeper was almost blind, 
one eye had been put out by an angry old wizard and through sympathy she was rapidly losing the power of seeing with the other this old dame was consequently very glad of some one to help her in spinning and knitting the introduction over the housekeeper takes duffy up into the garret where the wool was kept and where the spinning was done in the summer and requests her to commence her work the truth must be told duffy was an idle slut she could neither knit nor spin well here she was left alone and of course expected to produce a good specimen of her work the garret was piled from the floor to the key beams with fleeces of wool Duffy looked despairingly at them, and then sat herself down on the turn, the spinning wheel, and cried out, "'Curse the spinning and the knitting! The devil may spin and knit for the squire for what I care!' Scarcely had Duffy spoken these words than she heard a rustling noise behind some wool packs, and forth walked a queer-looking little man, with a remarkable pair of eyes which seemed to send out flashes of light." There was something uncommonly knowing in the twist of his mouth, and his curved nose had an air of curious intelligence. He was dressed in black, and moved towards Duffy with a jaunty air, knocking something against the floor at every step he took. "'Duffy, dear,' said this little gentleman, "'I'll do all the spinning and knitting for thee.' "'Thank ye,' says Duffy, quite astonished. Duffy, dear, a lady shall you be. Thank you, Your Honor, smiled Duffy. But, Duffy, dear, remember, coaxingly said the queer little man, remember that for all this, at the end of three years, you must go with me, unless you can find out my name. Duffy was not the least bit frightened, nor did she hesitate long, but presently struck a bargain with her kind but unknown friend, who told her she had only to wish, and her every wish should be fulfilled. And, as for the spinning and knitting, she would find all she required under the black ram's fleece. He then departed. How, Duffy could not tell, but in a moment the queer little gentleman was gone. Duffy sung in idleness and slept until it was time for her to make her appearance. So she wished for some yarns, and, looking under the black fleece, she found them. These were shown by the housekeeper to the squire, and both declared they had never seen such beautiful yarns. The next day, Duffy was to knit this yarn into stockings. Duffy idled, as only professed idlers can idle, but in due time, as if she had been excessively industrious, she produced a pair of stockings for the old squire. If the yarn was beautiful, the stockings were beyond all praise. They were as fine as silk and as strong as leather. Squire Lavelle soon gave them a trial, and when he came home at night after hunting, he declared he would never wear any other than Duffy's stockings. He had wandered all day through brake and briar, furs and brambles. There was not a scratch on his legs, and he was dry as a bone. There was no end to his praise of Duffy's stockings. Duffy had a rare time of it now. She could do what she pleased and rove where she willed. She was dancing on the mill bed half the day with all of the gossiping women who brought their grist to be ground. In those good old times, the ladies of the parish would take their corn to mill and surge the flour themselves. When a few of them met together, they would either tell stories or dance whilst the corn was grinding. Sometimes the dance would be on the mill bed, sometimes out on the green. On some occasions the miller's fiddle would be in request. At others the crowd, a sieve covered with sheepskin, was made to do the duty of a tambourine. So Duffy was always finding excuses to go to mill, and many around would she dance with the best people in the parish. Old Bet, the miller's wife, was a witch, and she found out who did Duffy's work for her. Duffy and Old Bet were always the best of friends, and she never told anyone about Duffy's knitting friend, nor did she ever say a word about the stockings being unfinished. There was always a stitch down. 
on sundays the people went to burian church from all parts to look at the squire's stockings and the old squire would stop at the cross proud enough to show them he could hunt through brambles and firs in all sorts of weather his old shanks were as sound as if bound up in leather duffy was now sought after by all the young men of the country and at last the squire fearing to lose a pretty girl and one who was so useful to him married her himself and she became according to the fashion of the time and place lady lavelle but she was commonly known by her neighbours as the duffy lady lady lavelle kept the devil hard at work stockings all sorts of fine underclothing bedding and much ornamental work the like of which was never seen was produced at command and passed off as her own duffy passed a merry time of it but somehow or other she was never happy when she was compelled to play the lady she passed much more of her time with the old crone at the mill than in the drawing-room at trove the squire sported and drank and cared little about duffy so long as she provided him with knitted garments the three years were nearly at an end duffy had tried every plan to find out the devil's name but had failed in all she began to fear that she should have to go off with her queer friend and duffy became melancholy Old Bet endeavoured to rouse her, persuading her that she could, from her long experience and many dealings with the imps of darkness, at the last moment put her in the way of escaping her doom. Duffy went day after day to her garret, and there each day was the devil driving and jeering till she was almost mad. There was but another day. Bet was seriously consulted now, and, as good as her word, she promised to use her power. Duffy Lady was to bring down to the mill that very evening a jack of the strongest beer she had in the cellar. She was not to go to bed until the squire returned from hunting, no matter how late, and she was to make no remark in reply to anything the squire might tell her. The jack of beer was duly carried to the mill, and Duffy returned home very melancholy to wait up for the squire. No sooner had Lady Lavelle left the mill than old Bet came out with the crowd over her shoulders and the blackjack in her hand. She shut the door, turned the water off the mill wheel, threw her red cloak about her, and away. She was seen by her neighbors going towards Bolite. A man saw the old woman trudging past the pipers and through the dawn's mane into the downs, but there he lost sight of her, and no one could tell where old Bet was gone to at that time of night. Duffy waited long and anxiously. By and by the dogs came home alone. They were covered with foam, their tongues were hanging out of their mouths, and the servants said they must have met the devil's hounds without heads. Duffy was seriously alarmed. Midnight came, but no squire. At last he arrived, but, like a crazy, crack-brained man, he kept singing, Here's to the devil with his wooden pick and shovel. He was neither drunk nor frightened, but wild with some strange excitement. After a long time, Squire Lavelle sat down and began, My dear Duffy, you haven't smiled this long time, but now I'll tell you something that would make you laugh if you're dying. If you'd seen what I've seen tonight, ha ha ha. Here's to the devil with his wooden pick and shovel. True to her orders, Duffy said not a word, but allowed the squire to ramble on as he pleased. At length he told her the following story of his adventures, with interruptions which have not been retained, and with numerous coarse expressions which are best forgotten. The Squire's Story of the Meeting of the Witches in the Fugu Hole there is a tradition firmly believed on the lower side of Burian that the Fugu Hole extends from the cliffs underground so far that the end of it is under the parlour of the Trimwewen's house in Trove, which is the only remaining portion of the old mansion of the Lavelles. Here the witches were in the habit of meeting the devil and holding their Sabbath. 
Often his dark highness has been heard piping while the witches danced to his music. A pool of water some distance from the entrance prevents any adventurer from exploring the hole to its termination. Hares often take refuge in the Fugu hole, from which they have never been known to return. Duffy Deer I left home at the break of day this morning. I hunted all the moors from Trove to Trevedere, and never started a hare all the live-long day. I determined to hunt all night, but that I'd have a brace to bring home. So, as nightfall, I went down Lamorna Bottoms, and then up Brainy Downses, and as we passed the Dawn's Main, up started a hare, as fine a hare as ever was seen. She passed the pipers, down through the reens, in the mouth of the dogs half the time, yet they couldn't catch her at all. As fine a chase as ever was seen, until she took into the fugu hole. In went the dogs after her, and I followed, the owls and bats flying round my head. On we went, through water and mud, a mile or more, I'm quite certain. I didn't know the place was so long before. At last we came to a broad pool of water, when the dogs lost the scent and ran back past me, howling and jowling, terrified almost to death. A little further on, I turned round a corner and saw a glimmering fire on the other side of the water, and there were St. Levin witches in scores. Some were riding on ragwort, some on brooms, some were floating on their three-legged stools, and some, who had been milking the little good cows and whales, had come back astride at the largest leeks they could find. Amongst the rest, there was our bet of the mill, with her crowd in her hand, and my own blackjack slung across her shoulders. In a short time, the witches gathered round the fire, and blowed it up after a strange fashion, till it burned up into a brilliant blue flame. Then I saw, amongst the rest, a queer little man in black, with a long forked tail, which he held high in the air and twirled around. Bet struck her crowd as soon as he appeared, and beat up the tune. Here's to the devil with his wood and pick and shovel, digging tin by the bushel with his tail cocked up. Then the queer little devil and all danced like the wind and went faster and faster, making such a clatter as if they had on each foot a pewter platter. Every time the man in black came round by old Bet, he took a good pull from my own blackjack, till at last, as if he had been drinking my best beer, he seemed to have lost his head when he jumped up and down, turned round and round, and roaring with laughter, sung, Duffy, my lady, you'll never know what, that my name is Terry Top, Terry Top Top. When the squire sung those lines, he stopped suddenly, thinking that Duffy was going to die. She turned pale and red and pale again. However, Duffy said nothing, and the squire proceeded. After the dance, all the witches made a ring around the fire, and again blew it up until the blue flames reached the top of the zone. Then the devil danced through and through the fire, and springing ever and anon amongst the witches, kicked them soundly. At last, I was shaking with laughter at the fun. I shouted, Go it, old Nick! And lo, the lights went out, and I had to fly with all my speed, for every one of the witches were after me. I scampered home somehow, and here I am. Why don't you laugh, Duffy? Duffy did laugh, and laugh right heartily now, and, when tired of their fun, the squire and the lady went to bed. Three years were up within an hour. Duffy had willed for an abundant supply of knitted things and filled every chest in the house. She was in the best chamber trying to cram some more stockings into a big chest when the queer little man in black appeared before her. Well, Duffy, my dear said he. I have been to my word, and served you truly for three years, as we agreed, so now I hope you will go with me, and make no objection. He bowed very obsequiously, almost to the ground, and regarded Duffy Lady with a very offensive leer. I fear, smiled Duffy, 
that your country is rather warm and might spoil my fair complexion. That is not so hot as some people say, Duffy, was his reply. But come along, I've kept my word, and of course a lady of your standing will keep your word also. Can you tell me my name? Duffy curtsied and smilingly said, You have behaved like a true gentleman, yet I wouldn't like to go so far. The devil frowned and approached as if he would lay forcible hands upon her. Maybe your name is Lucifer? He stamped his foot and grinned horridly. Lucifer! Lucifer! He's no other than a servant to me in my own country. Suddenly calming down, he said quietly, Lucifer, I would scarcely be seen speaking to him at court. But come along. When I spin for ladies, I expect honorable treatment at their hands. You two guesses more, but they're of little use. My name is not generally known on earth. Perhaps, smiled Duffy again, my lord's name is Beelzebub? How he grinned, and his sides shook with convulsive joy. Beelzebub, says he. Why, he's little better than the other, a common devil, he. I believe he is some sort of a cousin, a Cornish cousin, you know. I hope your honor, curtsied Duffy, will not take offense. Impute my mistake to ignorance. Our demon was rampant with joy. He danced around Duffy with a delight, and was, seeing that she hesitated, about to seize her somewhat roughly. Stop, stop, shouts Duffy. Perhaps you'll be honest enough to admit your name is Terry Top? The gentleman in black looked at Duffy, and she steadily looked him in the face. Terry Top, deny it if you dare, says she. A gentleman never denies his name, replied Terry Top, drawing himself up with much dignity. I did not expect to be beaten by a young minx like you, Duffy, but the pleasure of your company is merely postponed. With this, Terry Top departed in fire and smoke, and all the devil's knitting suddenly turned to ashes. Squire Lavelle was out hunting, away far on the moors. The day was cold and the winds piercing. Suddenly the stockings dropped from his legs and the homespun from his back, so that he came home with nothing on but his shirt and his shoes, almost dead with cold. All this was attributed by the squire to the influence of old Bet, who, he thought, had punished him for pursuing her with his dogs when she had assumed the form of a hare. The story, as told by the drolls, now rambles on. Duffy cannot furnish stockings. The squire is very wroth. There are many quarrels, mutual recriminations. Duffy's old sweetheart is called in to beat the squire, and eventually peace is procured by a stratagem of old bets, which would rather shock the sense of propriety in these our days. Old Bet is a good friend. I think we'd all like to know somebody who might, in a pinch, get the devil drunk for you. <laughs> to be honest, I kind of like how the story introduces her as a witch and a crone, and then we realize that, oh, that's not an insult, she really is a witch. Like Duffy herself, who is introduced as a hussy and a slut, which did originally mean a lazy, unclean woman, and again, we find out that she actually really is lazy and deceitful. But the squire will overlook anything as long as he gets those good, good stockings. <laughs> it's all pretty funny and ridiculous. And naturally, of course, this story is reminiscent of the story of Rumpelstiltskin. This is obviously a variant. Hunt, in the prelude to this story, cites several versions of it in different folklore traditions of Europe. Personally, I don't feel like that ruins it for me. I'm still interested in Duffy's story, and I want to see how it turns out, even if I feel like I know the plotline. Of course, Terry Top is confident that she'll end up in hell anyway, which may very well be true. To be honest, that's one of the things I kind of like about this story. Duffy isn't good, but she also isn't evil. 
she's lazy, she wants to drink and dance and have a good time. She might be a flirt and a liar, but she isn't actually a sinner in the sense that we often see it in these stories. In that sense, she's actually a very unusual character because normally young women like her are portrayed in these stories with a lot of venom and criticism, and they get punished by the end of the story. I like that Duffy has a kind of ordinary level of badness, and she's basically allowed to do her thing. If you're like me, this story presented you with a crazy new vocabulary word. Fugu, spelled F-O-G-O-U. A fugu is an underground dry stone structure, generally associated with Northern Europe and especially Britain during the Iron Age. Fugu, or vug, vau, fogos, fuggy hole, etc., is the Cornish name for them, although, of course, a fuggy hole might today be mistaken for something that would shock our sense of propriety. <laughs> There are less than 15 fugus in Cornwall, and nobody knows their original purpose. They were located inside human settlements, and they took an enormous amount of work to make, so they were clearly important to the society. At some sites, they appear to have been deliberately filled in again, maybe after the people left the settlement or they stopped using the fugu. But also, perhaps if they were filled in, there might be more of them. Wikipedia says that ritual use was unlikely because Iron Age Celtic Druids were very focused on the sky and the stars, and they probably wouldn't have worshipped or done rituals underground. The one in this story is probably the Boli Fugu. It's on the land's end near the Piper's Standing Stones, between Tree Wolf and Boli, as the story says. Unlike most fugus, this one actually has more than one entrance, which probably contributed to the local legend that rabbits went in and never came out, or went in and came out magically transformed. Amazingly, this fugu is entirely on the grounds of the Rosemarin House, and it was partially demolished in 1922 during the construction of that estate. It used to have a large oval chamber inside. The fugu was formally excavated and explored in 1945, and then it just hasn't had any kind of real archaeological work done since then. Apparently, every few decades, the ancient monument society people stop by and they take a look at it. Guests of the Rosemarin House, which is now a hotel and a like yoga retreat place, are free to explore the fugu, and members of the public can visit it by appointment. That's honestly crazy to me to just, like, have a mysterious Iron Age underground cave in your backyard. But what do you think they were made for? Let me know in the comments. If you listen all the way to the end of the video, you get to hear me make a confession. Tonight's confession is that there's this idea of the three-faced goddess, right? The girl, the woman, and the crone, and she represents all the ages and sort of powers of a woman over the course of her lifetime. But I honestly, I think it's simpler than that, and maybe even more adversarial. I think it's probably something like witches versus princesses. I think there's an interest and an aspiration and a fascination with princesses when a woman is young, and then it sort of gradually transitions into an interest and a fascination and an aspiration toward witches as one ages. I think it's a little creepy when someone is too young to be really fixated on witches, and it's equally creepy when someone is too old to fixate on princesses. I think we all start out with, like, princess power, but it kind of ripens, perhaps, into witch power. I'm saying this because perhaps Duffy and Old Bet are two ends of the same spectrum. They're at different points on the same path. But it is just a thought. Also, why doesn't the squire just make his own deal with the devil if he's so interested in stockings? Anyway, if you want to hear more stories about satanic stockings, you've come to the right place. I scour old books to find weird and obscure stories, and I share them with you. Subscribe and choose notifications so you don't miss anything. Please also like this video and consider leaving me a comment. It's lovely to get some feedback, and it also helps other people discover the channel. Thank you so much for your support, and I will see you in a few days.